Hi, it's Paul from Wicked Acorn. I'm on a reconnaissance mission. I'm working on a video about Greater Manchester's involvement in the Dam Busters. Now, three of the lads on the mission were born in what we now call Greater Manchester. And perhaps there are more that lived here, but I haven't really delved into that part of the story yet. But a friend of the channel and fellow YouTuber, Richard Ainsworth, gave me some tickets to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission's tour of Manchester Southern Cemetery. And they're focusing on the RAF graves. And I thought it might tie into our story. So thanks for that, Rick. But I better get going. The tour starts at 11. It's 1914 and Britain is desperately seeking able-bodied men to fight. The grim reality emerges that the average age of a combatant by war's end would be 18. The youngest authenticated British soldier in World War I, a mere 12-year-old Sidney Lewis, who fought in the Battle of the Somme, a haunting symbol of the youth caught up in the horrors of war. At 45, Fabian Ware finds he is too old to join the army. Instead, he leads a mobile unit in the British Red Cross, embarking on a mission that revolutionizes how fallen soldiers are honored. Before the 19th century, soldiers killed in combat were laid to rest in communal graves. Only a selected few leaders or famous heroes were bestowed with the honor of an individually marked war grave. This lack of recognition compels Ware to take action, aiming to honor each fallen soldier. As casualties mount, Ware's commission registers over 31,000 graves by October 1915 and 50,000 by May 1916, underscoring the magnitude of the task. The Army Department of Graves Registration and Inquiries is created with Ware at its head. Reports of their efforts reach grieving families, leading to numerous inquiries for photographs and information about cemetery locations. Supported by the Red Cross, the Commission begins sending these photographs, providing closure to the bereaved. The tangible memories conveyed through these photographs offer solace to grieving families who hold on to them dearly, knowing their fallen heroes are remembered with dignity. This extraordinary mission spearheaded by Ware and his dedicated team preserves the memory of those who made the ultimate sacrifice. This was the beginning of the Imperial War Graves Commission, now the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. So, as you can see here, we have the Cross of Sacrifice. Um, the Cross of Sacrifice will be, theoretically, um, in any cemetery um, in the UK um, that actually has over 40 burials. Now, in this cemetery, Manchester Southern Cemetery, there, there are over 1,200. Okay. So we actually have two. So this is the first one. So this is our first World War plot here. Okay. So a little bit about Manchester. So in the First World War, there was a lot of military hospitals in Manchester. And one of the closest was at the back road here, Nell Lane. And there was actually a military hospital there. Um, so we do have a lot of people in this cemetery, especially from the First World War, that died of wounds from one of the military hospitals in Manchester. Okay. There was a, um, a chain of military hospitals set up in the First World War called Western General in Manchester, and they were all military hospitals um, around the Greater Manchester area as well. But today we are focusing on some of the area casualties that we have in the cemetery. So if you want to follow me, we will walk over towards the Second World War plot. Because um, obviously the area was Second World War, but I will talk a bit more about that as we go over. The RAF wasn't actually formed until the end of the First World War, so 1918. So m the majority of our casualties will be down as either Royal Flying Corps in the First World War or Naval Aviation. Okay. So after, um, after the First World War, then that's when it really started to get formed, the RAF. And that's why 
the major all of the casualties that we'll be looking at today are from the second world war okay um so this is what we call a private memorial so if it ever does become illegible his name or if something or something happens to this then it will get a commemoration by us. He joined the Royal Flying Corps in 1916 and received a Royal Aero Club Aviator Certificate um, for flying a Maurice Fairman biplane at uh, a military school. On the 26th of September 1917, he was awarded the Military Cross and it was actually gazetted um, in 1918 as well, um, talking about him. His final posting was to number two school of navigation and bomb dropping and he unfortunately died from pneumonia on the 27th of February 1919 um, at the officers military hospital at Tidworth as well. So unfortunately we do find this a lot um, after with Spanish flu. Um, it generally if it's Spanish flu will be down on the death certificate as pneumonia. Um, so you know we had these people that actually you know what they actually went through in the first world war was extraordinarily and they survived all of that and then um was taken by spanish flu in 1919 so unfortunately that's a very familiar story in this cemetery um, as we're getting towards this area here now you will tend to find that these are second world war casualties and the majority of them are raf as well in this area um, so on that, I just wanted to speak a little bit about the RAF in Manchester at the time. Um, so we had uh, Ringway, which is obviously the Manchester Airport now. So we had we had Ringway. Um, we had the um, Avro factory at Woodford. Um, we had the Royal Naval Air Station as well at Stretton. Um, Barton Aerodrome and Tatton Park was a military airfield and training as well and then we've got the Heaton Park as well um, so Heaton Park was kind of like um, a dispatch like holding place um, for the RAF and um, so when they'd done like the first lot of training and then they were getting sent on to where they were going to be that was then they would be put at Hinton Park but they did do different things there as well and um, like for example Bowley uh, you had the fighter control unit which is just next to um, Hinton Park I don't know whether anyone knows the areas um, but this is why as well we do have quite a lot of RAF casualties um, in this cemetery as well and as we go over um, we do have um, a lot of cremations and I don't know whether people know this, but even in the Second World War, there wasn't that many cemeteries that had a crematoria. So we do get a lot of people that requested that they wanted to, the family members that said that they wanted to be cremated. Like we, I'll talk about a South Asian casualty um, when we go over there. And that was one of the reasons as well, because it was quite difficult to actually find somewhere that had those facilities as well. So you will find that people would have been brought here for that reason. This year, the 80th commemorations for the Lancaster bomber as well which was uh, developed by um, Avro and some of them were in the Avro factory. Now Avro, if anyone knows anything about RAF planes, they developed the Manchester bomber which was notoriously <laughs> a bit dodgy but then when it did get developed that's when the Lancaster was born and as we know you know absolutely fantastic. Someone was talking about the dam busters before, it was you know an integral part of that mission as well and you know we did have that factory here in the northwest as well so yeah pretty important they did all different things as well you know like to try and cover up the airfields um, and especially the factories so where they put like on the top of the roofs of the factories they'd put make it kind of look like it was a field as well so if uh, German pilots were flying over they didn't know uh, what they were, they were actually looking at a factory but it looked like from the aerial that they were looking at just another field so so this is our second world war plot all of the casualties that are on the two front panels are actually buried here so they did originally have the um, 
the wooden markers, which is what we would put on there before we actually put the headstones on, we decided to take up the markers and put the names on the screen wall in keeping with the First World War plot. Mm. The rest of the titles that are on the other panels here, um, they are cremations. Okay. So if you actually do, someone was asking me this question before, if you actually do want to find one of the casual people at the cremation, it's down on our database as Southern uh, Crematorium, not Southern Cemetery. We have another cross of sacrifice, as you can notice here. So this actually, you can see this one's a lot smaller. Um, and uh, we have four different sizes. So it depends on which size, depends on the location in the cemetery. It sometimes goes off how many. Um, you've got in the cemetery, but a lot of the time it will depend on what land room is given um, and in keeping with where it's actually going to be as well. I don't know whether I mentioned before, the Cross of Sacrifice was designed by Sir Reginald Blomfield um, and you have got the sword going down. So this is to reflect uh, the faith of the majority that are commemorated in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Um, in some cemeteries, usually with over a thousand, we do have the Stone of Remembrance as well. We don't actually, even though we've got over a thousand in the cemetery, we don't actually have a Stone of Remembrance. Again, we've looked through the archives to see why, but we've, we've not come up with anything. Mm -hmm. um, probably because we do have the two separate plots and we have got the screen walls as well. Um, so the words that are written on the Stone of Remembrance are actually written on the screen walls as well and the words were chosen by um rudyard kipling okay um and i don't know people you might know that he did lose a son in the mm -hmm. first world war thank you and we have panel 10 is where Oh, no, that's ATS. ATS. And we have um, Edna Dodds is on panel 10. Oh, okay. mm. We've got 10 women in total in Manchester of our commemorations, three of them RAF auxiliary. Yeah. But this is our standard headstone, okay? So our principles from when we started was that everyone will be commemorated equally and this was the design that was chosen. Now it's a bit controversial at the start because a lot of people wanted like the Americans have, like the crosses, or, um, but we decided, you know, we're representing people from all different ethnicities and faiths and we didn't want to have it like that. We wanted to have it so that their religious emblem, if they wanted one, could be put on the headstone and it would all be uniform as well. So this is what we decided on, okay? And this is, you can always read one of our casualties um, by looking at the headstone, okay? So the cat badge will be at the top sometimes if it's one of those cap badges that's like a funny shape that's a bit elongated some of the regiments have they will sometimes if they have a cross if they were a christian they'll have them on the broad cross so if anyone's seen them they'll have the cap badge in the middle it was started by the new zealanders um because their cap badges kind of fit in with that style but some of our regiments actually adopted that and it was more to do with what kind of suited the cross a bit more as well so you will always have the service number and um, the name to so be able to tell that and um, the rank that we had um, at the time when they died and um, where they um, what regiment they were in and the date that they died now this here we've got the age he was 20 they won't always have the age and especially from the First World War, we'll have a lot that don't have the age on there. We'll only put the age on there if we know 100% that that is what their age was and we have the evidence to show that. And unfortunately from the First World War, a lot of people did lie about their ages and we don't have the evidence. So if we haven't got the evidence, we won't say. It's not that we're trying to hide the age or anything like that. You know, if we know, for example, they were 14 and we've got the proof of that, we will put that age on there. It's just only if we 100% know that that 
then they will have the chance to have a religious emblem you don't have to have a religious emblem if you if they're not religious then that will just be left blank and then the family could choose or the next of kin could choose to have an inscription put at the bottom as well yeah so some will have inscriptions some won't so I do know a little bit more about this man here. Um, so Sergeant Robert James Borland. Um, so he was a navigator on a Wellington bomber. Um, he was unfortunately um, the aircraft. Uh, he lost his life on, on the aircraft on the Wellington and three others um, lost their lives that day um, on the aircraft. So there was actually five a crew of five on a Wellington bomber. So there was actually only the pilot that survived and four of them lost their lives. Um, so it was Squadron 26 Operational Training Unit and it was a Wellington X. And it was during a bombing practice over Hogshaw Range in Buckinghamshire. Yeah. So. Any questions? We are going to have um, to finish up now. Question about the uh, family inscription at the bottom. Yes. Now, <coughs> I'm stronger on World War One than I'm on World War Two. Okay. And what I understand from World War One is that um, you know the, the thinking is these guys are going to be buried away from home, therefore the family can have an input in what's written. But they recognise that, uh, and it would be you know, so many pence, you know, six pence per letter, mm. whatever. They recognised that a lot of families wouldn't be able to afford that, so it, there was a general understanding of choose what you want. We're not actually going to ask you for the money. You know, we'll invite you to pay, but we're not going to chase it yeah. up. I think it was about twelve and a half pence, right. and you're exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So now that, it that was World War One. Was it the same in World War Two? Yeah, II? it was the same. Right. So there was kind of an understanding that we weren't ever going to kind of hound people for the money. We'd say, this is how much, you know, it, you know, it is per character. Um, but it wasn't like we were like debt collectors trying to get the money or anything like that. But unfortunately in the first world, especially before people knew this, I don't know anything like me, if I couldn't afford something, I wouldn't have it if I knew yeah. I couldn't afford it. I wouldn't think, oh, I'll get it and then just not pay. So some other members of the Commonwealth countries actually had different decisions about that yeah. for that reason. Um, so uh, New Zealand, that no one had it, because they said if everyone couldn't have it the same, no one had it. Um, Australia and Canada, uh, that was paid, paid for them. Yeah. Um, yeah, they Am I going to be taking too much here now? No, 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 it's going to go a lot deeper yet, so we're okay for a minute. Try and get past that where it's stopped at the moment, onto the fresh bit. That's it. Liz, thanks for uh, showing us around. No, you're welcome. So, don't know what we're going to do with this video. I hope the audio is listenable not too much wind but uh had a great time here today it was uh, very informative and uh, this is all part of the video that i'm wanting to do on the dam busters and more specifically the lancaster and how it was built here in greater manchester and you'll see that story soon i hope it's uh it's quite the rabbit hole i've gone down uh researching the Lancaster being built here in Greater Manchester. So, we will see you in the next one.